my name is Dan Brodkin. I'm a principal with Arup. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary design firm and we provided a wide range of services on this project. I personally happen to be a structural engineer and I'm the engineer of record and the, the lead structural engineer for this project. We are actually sitting up on the 14th floor overlooking uh, Manhattanville. So we have a nice view from the existing campus, the last uh, planned building on the existing campus, towards the new campus. We're sitting just above Dodge Hall, which is the varsity basketball gym. Columbia was clear that while they had high design ambitions for this project, we were not to interrupt the basketball season. Um, so it became clear that we were going to leave the gym in place and span across it with the new structure. And uh, at the outset of the project, we sat down and worked very closely with the architects uh, to look at a few options. Pretty quickly, we developed a scheme of bracing the full height of the building to act as a truss with a diagonal in every panel between the columns and the beams. Now we discovered that once we created a truss that actually the system was so efficient that we didn't need to put a diagonal in every single panel. And that was quite interesting because that meant we had choices. We tried a few different things and eventually we devised what we called the random structure generator. This is um, a program that we wrote to group uh, different components based on how hard they were working structurally and so we went through this pruning activity removing a large proportion of elements from the members that are not working very hard and a small proportion from the ones that are working hard. We call it structurally weighted random generation. I guess what really happened was we made a tool and we had a new toy and we started to play with it. We would sort of fine-tune those overall parameters and then the computer would do the rest in terms of selecting the structure for us and then we would check its efficiency and its, you know, the fact that it worked. Now the interesting thing about the algorithm that I just described is it does have an element of chance and randomness in it. So every time we ran the same program with the same forces for the same building, we got a different result. So we were able to come up with a whole bunch of different alternatives and present them to the architects and have a discussion about what was interesting from the point of view of the aesthetic on the outside of the building and what gave a nice balanced pattern of daylighting on the inside of the building. The diagonal panels are actually opaque and the panels that don't have diagonals, they have windows and spandrel glass, so they're transparent. And so the, the solution for the structure on the outside of the building became integral with the lighting and the daylighting on the inside of the building. So the inside and the outside were sort of connected through this solution. Most of what we just described um, for this random generation, although we applied it to the, uh, to the whole building, it was motivated by the needs to span the gym for the southern two-thirds or so of the building. We're sitting actually in the northern one-third of the building, and the situation here is a little bit different. So usually in buildings, we like to have spaces that need tight column grids, low down, and then we start to remove columns as we go higher into the building, because there's not or the accumulated load of the rest of the building sitting on top of it. Well here, the program is stacked the other way around. The big spaces are on the bottom. So we have an open lobby at the ground level with no columns. Joe's Cafe right above that, it's also a large column free space. And above Joe's Cafe is a classroom. It's also column free. And above the classroom, we have a whole series of labs that extend up to the level that we're sitting on right now. So in a sense, it's upside down. So what we did was we thought it would be helpful to make the structure work upside down. So all of that structure is actually hanging off the trusses that we have right behind me. So we never needed to transfer any of the loads or anything as we went down. We just hung them all from above. Now with all of that weight hanging, there's another advantage here. Because this side of the structure is hanging off of that same random system we just talked about and acts as a counterweight to the part of the building that's spanning across the gym. So that counterbalancing effect actually reduced some of the demand on the structure and lightened up some of the steel. And I like to sit in Joe's Cafe and look around at people and wonder if any of them get the fact that they're hanging off the 14th floor. I, I doubt it. Another challenge of the project is one of the main subway lines that supports Columbia is the one line. And the one line runs right up Broadway, rumbling back and forth all day long. And we're sitting in a building that is occupied by some of the world's premier scientists. And a lot of their laboratory experiments rely on very sophisticated equipment that is sensitive to vibrations. We had a concern that the vibration uh, from the train would somehow accelerate as it moved up through the building and disturb some of these experiments. So the approach that we took uh, was our acoustics team got involved and they did some measurements 
in the utility tunnels that are near the foundations of, the, of this building. Um, of course, prior to those foundations being built, right? And they took some measurements uh, for several days as the trains uh, moved around. And then uh, we built, the structural team built a structural engineering model and used that vibration information as input. And they basically shook the model and observed how the vibrations moved through the structure. So we were able to confirm that the vibrations did not accelerate as they flowed up through the building. One of the interesting characteristics of this project is that I personally worked very closely with Charlie Whitney of Turner Construction to develop a design that was buildable. The nature of this, this bracing system is such that the steel can't hold up the building until the steel is the full height of the building. So we analyzed it in such a way that represents the staging of construction sort of in concert with what uh, Charlie was recommending that we do. So hidden in the foundations were some extra footings, but they're meant to support all of this structure before the trusses behind me were built and we were able to hang it. You know, in this case, the architects were intrinsically and directly involved in everything. We worked very, very closely together. And for me, that's really a much more satisfying way of working. There's no assumed solution or understood solution when you start. You have to go on a journey and explore and try some things. And it's quite nice because people learn from each other. Will Paxson and Rafael Mineo and others were quite open about what they were trying to accomplish. So I actually learned quite a lot. A lot of the ideas that I'm talking about are, are things that were contributed by every person on the team. And you kind of lose track of and it's great to lose track of who contributed which idea. You're just in a community of people that are trying to work together to accomplish something, each with sort of a different perspective that they bring to it. And I think, actually, that that's very symbolic of good design. This building says that it's well designed. And so I'm quite proud of it as sort of a beacon here at Columbia University, looking over to their new campus, you know, to have participated in creating this important symbol.